But look at this discrepancy. Look at that. That verbal comprehension score, he's 18, 68, and his perceptual reasoning, 116. You know, they could hardly be farther apart. So then we're going to add these other parts in, where, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how he did. But we have working memory, so you know what that is. It's things like digit span. And then the processing speed, which is 79. So these are kind of all over the place. So what about a full-scale IQ? Well, you see, a full-scale IQ doesn't even make sense. Because once you put those numbers together, and actually I'll tell you what it is, if you put those numbers together and you look it up, the score is 80. Well, the 80 doesn't tell you anything, because really what you have is you have a 68 and you have a 116. So it makes no sense to have an 80. So oftentimes what the report will say is there's a place in the table and it'll just say not applicable or not or something. And then it'll say, like I would say, all right, because of the large discrepancies, the overall or full-scale IQ is not the best estimate of this child's ability and therefore it isn't reported. So that's the reason. So an 80 just doesn't mean anything. But the thing that was interesting about this is that here we have this processing speed score, which was 79, which is on the lower side, and that's for doing paper and pencil tests. But it didn't just end with that. It was his processing speed for everything. But, and then the other thing that was sort of interesting about that, about him, was that he seemed oblivious to the fact that it was taking him so long. That people were constantly, it wasn't just repeating the numbers, it was, you know, what does this word mean? And he's thinking, and he's thinking. And, and this is difficult with young children, sometimes they don't know when they just sit there. But he's thinking, and then he comes up with the right answer. So anyway, so terribly slow processing speed. Um, so what happens if you read him a brief story, and then he has to tell back the details? Is he going to be able to hear all of those details in a normal conversation? Well, as it turns out, he couldn't. And so this is where the slow processing then begins to connect and it leads to, okay, well, what happens on other memory tests? So you read him a little story. It's really only a paragraph long, and he has to retell it. There's 25 details, and he could remember only three of them. So what's happening every day in school, we have this, first of all, his verbal comprehension is low. That doesn't really have to do with the processing speed because these aren't timed tests. Actually, this is kind of amazing because some of these are timed, but anyway, so his, his scores are low, his processing is low, he's sitting in class trying to listen to the teacher who's talking. And do you think he knows what's going on? He doesn't, he doesn't have a clue what's going on. And this has been his problem for years. So here he is at age 18. His reading comprehension is actually at a grade four level, and math is at a grade six. And he's, he's trying to complete you know, some grade 12. He's doing it by sort of home study right now. OK, this is what we know about his other problem solving. So the problem solving is a little different than just what we see on the vocabulary and, and the comprehension and the verbal comprehension score. But on the test of problem solving, he, he's given little scenarios and he has to say, well, what happened before and what's happening next and how would you solve this problem? And the results of that, also in the low range, help to explain poor choices that he would make. And part of his poor choices was that he had a difficulty looking at things from somebody else's perspective, and he was so egocentric, he was always blaming everybody else for what happened that went wrong. But if kids are saying to him, come on, let's go and do something, and it's inappropriate, he can't think fast enough to decide whether this is going to be a good choice or a bad choice. Even when given all the time in the world, he doesn't always make good choices. But it's that day to day saying, oh, let's, let's go and jump on the sky train. And OK, well, he might as well just go along with him because he doesn't know. He can't think fast enough. Um, so, but you can see, really, look at everything is just, it's very consistent. 65, 64, 62, 65. Um, I'll talk more about language skills later, but those scores are low. But guess what? I couldn't believe it. 
he had average scores on the tests of memory. This isn't the working memory on the uh, WISC, but it's the children's scale. He has to listen to stories and repeat them back and remember details. He has to learn these weird word pairs. He has to look at pictures of families doing things and remember who was in each one and what they were doing. And I just, this just didn't fit with what I expected to have these scores that are so low and the memory was average. But then what his mom was able to say was, oh yeah, he can memorize anything. And then she talked about the fact that certain, not only can he memorize things, but he has this real interest in reptiles and dinosaurs and snakes. And she talked about how in class he gave his report and he had memorized it. And he was able to do a fantastic job. So I thought, wow, you know something? This is really good to know that he can memorize something. So you can, you can promote his self-esteem when he's able to use that skill that he has, even though, you know, he's going to be struggling. Academically, he's going to have trouble. And you know something, and I think that as time goes on, he's in grade three, the memory isn't going to work to his advantage quite as well because what he would have to memorize would be too abstract, and you can't really memorize things that, that you don't understand too well. But this was, was just totally blowing me away. So here's a child with his low scores on the IQ test, but on the adaptive, the daily living skills, 74, and socialization, 91. So that 91 was in the average range. Now, that previous assessment that placed him higher, there was a teacher rating that placed him below 56. And so all I have is the previous report. I don't really know what that meant or if, was a, if the teacher had known him very long or what. But this is a child that's extremely social. And so um, here's a uh, test, supporting peers. So on this test, the idea is you, the uh, scenario is printed, presented to the child about a friend who's having a difficulty. And your job is to say something to the friend to make him feel better. And so sometimes we don't tell the blunt truth. You know, we just say something to make him feel better. So an example might be your friend comes to school, he has a, a new haircut, and it's really a terrible haircut, and he's feeling embarrassed. You know, what do you say to him? Okay, so this child's ability to support his peers was just like every other child his age. So this was so good to see, too, that those social skills, making inferences meant that he was able to look at a situation and think about, based on the facial cues and their gestures, figure out what that person was thinking or, or going to do. So that was really strong. What wasn't very strong was multiple perspectives, multiple interpretations, rather. So on this type of test, he's shown a picture scenario and he's supposed to give several reasons why it's happening, what could be happening. So, for example, one picture shows a boy sitting by the curb. Okay, what could be happening? And he's sitting there with his backpack. Well, one thing might be that he's waiting for his mother to pick him up from school. Okay, well, what's another thing that could be happening? And so the ability to think about possible things. And so he gave some really kind of outrageous answers for this. So one of them was, it shows a mother, or a lady anyway, um, she has the phone in her hand and she's looking really, you know, angry. And, you know, so what's going on there? Well, you know, did she just get a bad phone call? Or, you know, is the phone not working? I mean, you, you could think of a lot of scenarios. Then he says, uh, I'm very rich and I'm going to get a job. Like, <laughs> so, so sometimes the, the abilities fell short. But keep in mind, this is a child whose overall levels are, are, are quite delayed. Okay, so now this is a very interesting boy. Talking about high IQs and how IQ isn't everything, but how IQ can really confuse people. So here we have a child whose verbal score is 118 and perceptual reasoning 114. Word reading, that's reading words from a word list, 122. You can put any word in front of him and he can read it. Reading comprehension is still great. Give him passages to read, ask questions, he can do it. Numerical operations, 90. So a little bit more problems. These are just basic computations. And math fluency, 80. Now this raises a, a dilemma about does this child have a learning disability or not? Because if it were another child, 
whose IQ was around 80, 85, and you saw a math fluency 80, you'd say, oh, well, that's pretty well in line. But this is way out of line, and math fluency meaning that uh, how fast he can do computations and everything. You know, here he is 13 and still on his fingers and so on. Daily living skills, 68, socialization, 61. How can that be? He's so smart, and yet his, his sort of the, uh, common sense, good judgment, is in this extremely low range. Like, it just doesn't make sense. So, with, so but here's an example of his reasoning and why things just don't work out. Um, his mom gave permission for anecdotes to be used, and in his family there are other siblings, some older, some younger, but they all have some of the same difficulties. But he's, he's exceptionally bright. And, and you, can, you can see it, you know, he just comes into your office, and the vocabulary that he's using, but he's also a kid that sometimes it isn't used correctly. But here's the example. This is, this is the adaptive. She says, well, in our house, because there's a lot of kids, we have a, we have, um, a very sensitive smoke detector, she says for obvious reasons, she says. And so frequently what happens, it happens to all of us, she said, is that if the toaster is on the kitchen island and the toast burns, that's, that smoke you know, is enough to set off the smoke alarm. And so that happens on a regular basis. And so she said, and so you know, what we do, what everybody does, you get a towel and you fan it and you try to dispense the, the smoke. She says, okay, well on this particular day, what had happened was one of the kids um, had, had made some toast but didn't eat it and put it on a plate in the microwave. So it was buttered toast in the microwave. They have two microwaves in the kitchen. And it was then noon, and so the kids were coming in, and they got out a couple of frozen dinner things, and they put them in the other microwave. All right. Well, then a little bit of time goes by, and all of a sudden, Smoke alarm goes off. So they're fanning their smoke alarm. They're fanning the smoke alarm. And so a mother comes racing downstairs to see what's happening now. And she says, look, and the microwave is on fire. And the kids look at it and then continue fan fanning the smoke alarm. Because this happens on a daily basis or something similar. So then in the aftermath of this, saying to, the, to this boy, her son, 13-year-old son, well, uh, what happened there was you turned on the wrong microwave. And he said, well, I was cooking the frozen dinners. And, and she says, but you didn't turn on that microwave. You turned on this microwave. He says, no, I didn't. So they pull it out of the microwave. It's still frozen. See, you didn't turn on this microwave. Yes, I did. <laughs> and so anyway, so reasoning. So there's these reasoning problems. And um, what he says about himself, he says, I try really hard, but I don't get it. But I'm not stupid. You know something, and that, that pretty much kind of describes, he's very smart in many ways, but some of those judgment things, they just don't work out for him. Socially, he's like a six-year-old. He still likes to play Superman, superheroes. Okay, apologies. Something goes wrong, and he needs to apologize. And he doesn't apologize, and so that makes everybody mad at him, at school particularly. But it takes him two days to finally figure out what actually happened here so that I do need to apologize. Because he wants to do the right thing, but it took him that long uh, to figure it out. He doesn't grasp sarcasm. He has no idea of his effect on others, no sense of time. High anxiety really is playing a big role here. And just uh, no personal boundaries. Mom says he was exhausted by play dates. He doesn't know what to say. So play dates aren't fun because he can't figure out what to say. So that social part was really uh, a problem for him. And then just one other e example with him was uh, one of the other siblings, they don't, the, the sibling would like to know who her father is. And no one knows who the father is. Boy says, well, that's easy. Go on Ancestry.com. <laughs> Mom says, well, but you need to have a name. And he says, well, just Google it. 